So now I'm going to introduce you to a little bit of a problem that immunologists have, uh, were struggling with in the past. Um, and I'm going to introduce you to the problem and then some general ideas that people had about solutions. Uh, and then we'll start talking about what the actual solution is. Um, so um, the problem was first sort of realized with Landsteiner when he was doing his experiments to look at antibody specificity, where he was able to see that there were these antibodies that could distinguish um, these molecules, and he was able to kind of start to realize just how many things antibodies could recognize. Um, as I talk about this, um, I'm going to give you current numbers um, for this problem. Uh, the numbers officially when Landsteiner first figured this out were slightly different, but it doesn't make sense for me to give you old numbers, so I'll give you the current numbers. The problem's still the same. Um, and basically what Landsteiner figured out was that um, it seemed as though we could make about 10 to the 16th different antibodies. Um, so if we counted different specificities. So, you know, the one against this epitope and the one against that epitope and the one against the other epitope. If you count them all up, you get 10 to the 16th. So you, wanna, you should remember that antibodies are proteins. And if you think about it, um, if Dr. Dunaway was here, he would certainly remind us all that proteins are encoded by genes. So we can make 10 to the 16th different antibodies, yet there are 2.4 times, 2 times 10 to the 4th genes in the genome. Um, so what you should notice here, and again, I'm giving you the current numbers instead of Landsteiner's numbers, but it's the same problem no matter what. These numbers are really different. <laughs> you make more antibody, different antibody proteins than you have genes in the genome. So how the heck can you figure that out? And how the heck can we make this work? Um, this problem consumed immunologists for 70-ish years <laughs> um, before they could figure out the answer. So. I want to first give you a couple of observations that are key in how we think about this um, and how, I mean, I'll just sort of think this through. Okay, so these are some other things people knew in addition to this numbers problem. So one thing that we also know is that B cells are making the antibodies and they also make um, a B cell receptor that is basically identical um, to the antibody that they will secrete. So somehow this diversity problem is answered in B cells or answered by B cells. B cells are going to be a piece of this. And one thing that's actually implied here that I, I actually have not flat out told you, but I need to make sure I flat out tell you here and again and again and again and again, um, is that the way that this works is that each B cell makes only one kind of antibody. So in fact, what that means is that not only are there probably 10 to the 16th different antibodies that can be made, there must be 10 to the 16th different B cells making them. You have one B cell making one antibody. So the B cell makes its one type of antibody, might make many copies of it, might make, I mean, hey, maybe if you had a really good vaccine or something, you'd make, that one B cell would make like a gram of it. I think that's actually possible, but that's easier to say than for me to think about real math. So we'll say it's like a, and it also makes a membrane bound version as its receptor, but it only makes that one. Um, in fact, we have a process known as um, allelic exclusion, that means that 
B cells always make multiple copies of the same receptor, and they only make one kind of antibody. So you can see that this B cell makes multiple copies of the blue and red antibody. It doesn't do any mixing and matching <laughs> um, here. Every B cell makes just one antibody kind. Um, so there was sort of this knowledge, um, at least that we now have, that um, the B cells are going to be making individual B cell receptors and antibodies. But there were also some other things um, that people had observed when trying to think about this numbers problem. Um, one, they had made observations about secondary immune responses. They knew um, that the second time you are infected with something, you get a bigger response. They knew that the response improved, and this is particularly true with an antibody response. So they knew that, and if you remember when we talked about von Behring and Kitasato, um, they knew that the response was specific, and they knew that there was this memory that you could see where the response would improve over time. And they also knew that that improvement could, could include improvement in terms of switching of isotypes or class switch, um, as well as improvements in terms of the uh, binding strength of antigen for antibody. Um, and so they kind of realized that um, these things probably all had to play a part in the solution to the, um, this problem and this diversity problem. On the next two slides, I'm going to show you two um, hypotheses that people came up with for how this could work. They are both wrong. I'm going to tell you the two really wrong hypotheses. Um, but we're going to think about what makes them wrong. Why would they be really bad? Why would, based on your knowledge, they really not work? And that's going to help us understand what features should be present in a solution that does work. Okay? So I don't care that, like, afterwards, like, sometimes people are like, but what am I supposed to know about this scientist and his theory? And I'm like, that it's wrong. Like, you don't need to know big details. The point here is that you can see what is important in a, re in a correct hypothesis. Um, so the first of these um, was uh, made up by a guy named Paul Ehrlich. Um, he came up with this in 1900. Um, don't feel too bad about Paul Ehrlich here that I'm making fun of him because Paul Ehrlich won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> Um, for some of his other work on antibodies. <laughs> um, so, we, so he can handle getting made fun of. Um, so Paul Ehrlich had this idea that there was this cell that made antibodies. Um, and it could bind to antigen stuff. And if the antigen stuff bound, the cell would make more of whatever bound to the antigen, the little antibody thing. And eventually, when the cell made so much, the antibodies would fall off. And then you have antibodies. <laughs> and so basically, the cell is going to start sort of responding to whatever it sees, making more of it, and eventually, those are going to fall off, and that's going to be your antibodies. And so it was all about kind of having these side chains get made in response to um, antigens. So if you look at this, this is a uh, not great. Um, and this was further refined um, in another theory known as the direct template scheme. Um, there were a couple people who were involved with the direct template scheme, one of whom was Niels Yern, who won the Nobel Prize for his other work on antibodies. Um, the other one was Linus Pauling, who is one of the only people who won two Nobel Prizes. Um, for both his work on understanding vitamin C and nuclear uh, disarmament. Um, and this isn't even his most embarrassing bad theory. He has an alternative theory of the structure of DNA. It was real bad. 
So, <laughs> so <laughs> we're all good. So um, Linus Pauling basically had this idea that you have this completely unfolded protein molecule um, that when it comes in contact with antigen, um, it starts to fold around the antigen and fold and fold and fold. And the more times you see the antigen, the better the folding gets until eventually you get many of these perfectly folded proteins that bind to the antigen and you have this perfectly done improved molecule. Um, so based on, if you look at these two theories, um, direct template being a really good example, which is why I have it here for you. What's wrong with this based on what you guys know, because you guys now know in some cases more molecular biology uh, and biochemistry than Pauling did, even if he wrote the textbook, because um, that was like in the 40s. Um, what's wrong with this? Why would this, this not work? Yeah, Sydney. So, so A, neither of these have anything that help you respond to self versus non-self. So in this case and in the other case, you could make lots and lots of antibodies to non-self. So you would have lots of autoimmune diseases. Um, that's going to come back to us a little bit next week. So um, yeah. <laughs> Um, so that's, so, all right, so there's a problem here in terms of how we deal with self, non-self. Uh, and the reason, I guess, a better way of approaching what Sydney just said is that the way that we really address that in the, the actual process that I'm going to tell you about is something we're really going to get to next week. So it may look for the next couple days like the, the process I teach you also has no way of dealing with self, non-self, but it does. We're just not going to get there till next week. <laughs> Is my better way of answering that. Um, all right, so what else? There, there's some other things that are pretty wrong here. Um, in, in, if anybody thinks about any uh, biochemistry, is this how protein structure works? No, this is not how proteins work. The protein sequence tells the protein how it's going to fold. It doesn't do this weird foldy in response thing. This is just like not how protein structure works. So that's, that's just wrong. Um, the other big problem I like to think about mostly with this one. Can you guys come up with any other reasons why this would be real bad? This is, again, this is true of both of them. Just to me, I can get it from this picture easier than the other one. Yep, Sebastian. Okay, so it seems a little difficult to regulate if you look at this process. Um, definitely true. Still one other piece. So if we look at this, or if we think about that previous page, uh, the previous version, it's like a lot of work to make these antibodies, right? Like look how much, how long this process is to make this little teardroppy antibody guy, right? It's like that cell is doing a whole lot of work. What happens if this cell dies? What? Yikes. Yikes. What happens if the cell dies? Huh? No good things. Do we have more antibodies? No, we're out of luck. We went through all this work, and then if the cell dies, we're done. We have no more antibodies. So, um... There are situations where we see people who have antibodies following different responses for 50 plus years. We now know. Um, do you think it seems realistic that we made the perfect cell and then it lived for 50 plus years? Mm 
No. So what's missing here in both of these schemes? What little additional piece of stuff are we not talking about here? It's kind of related to that number I put on the board. Yeah, Sydney. The genome. Here we're basically looking at ways that proteins can change and proteins can change and proteins can change. And we haven't talked about DNA at all. You guys might have learned in the past about someone called Lamarck in evolution. He was the guy who said that the reason why giraffes had long necks is because their ancestors reached really high. Um, clearly, my ancestors were not doing any reaching. Um, right? And he was talking about, you know, you inherited a trait because you used it or something. This is actually Lamarck. This is you inherited traits, aka proteins, because you folded them. And that's not true. We know that the way that this actually works is stuff has to happen to the genome. And that's especially important because that's how, if one, we get, lose one cell, we have other cells that have that same genetic information to be progeny. And so what was realized was that all of this has to be DNA related. Uh, it can't be just sort of proteins do fun things. Um, and so we've got to kind of drill down to the genome. And this is the um, sort of basis of perhaps one of the most important, perhaps the most important um, idea in adaptive immunity. So I'm going to talk through this slide, but I also want to tell you one other thing about this slide before I go into it. If you notice, both of the figures on this slide I've written are adapted from textbook figures. The reason why I say that is because in both cases, I have removed some stuff. I've put white boxes over some stuff, so you can't see the whole process. And that's because I'm simplifying this out and taking out one complicating feature. <laughs> we are going to see that one complicating feature come up next week. It's actually going to deal with the self non self thing that Sydney mentioned. So right now we're, we're, we're going to put that to the side. <laughs> we will come back to it. Um, and we're just going to think about this process as shown here, which is something known as the clonal selection or clonal expansion theory. This is perhaps one of the, mo the things that people who don't know immunology get wrong or like misunderstand about immunology. And so it's one that I make sure we talk about a lot. Um, and so the way um, the adaptive immune response works, and specifically in our case, the way antibody production um, by B cells works, is that we have some sort of stem cell. Um, and that stem cell will um, go through this process that we're going to talk about to give us a set of diverse um, progeny. So we are going to have this stem cell. It's going to do some genetics fun. <laughs> and it is going to make diverse progeny. You can see the diverse progeny here. You can also see the diverse progeny here. <laughs> this is going to happen in the primary lymphoid organ. This is happening before you are ever infected. Basically, it is happening randomly. Later, you will say to me, when you say random, what do you mean by random? You don't really mean random, do you? Yes, I mean random. When I say random, I mean totally randomly. It's happening totally randomly. Basically, you are going to develop so many new B cells that you have one B cell that makes every antibody, just based on math in terms of this randomness process. So right now, even if you haven't had COVID, you have one B cell making an antibody against SARS-CoV-2 and epitope. In fact, not only that, COVID-19 is called COVID-19 because it started in 2019. We expect there will probably be more coronaviruses in the future. You right now, right this minute, have one B cell 
that was made in this diversity process that has the perfect B cell receptor and makes the perfect antibody to respond to COVID-27. You got it right now. But you only got one. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. So I'll come back to that. So the idea is you only have one. Basically, you have one of every B cell right now. But one's not really enough to help you. If you actually had to wait and to develop that one cell after the virus came around, remember how we talked about how fast microbes were at replicating? You could never do it in time. So you got to have one of everything to start with. But if you are ever infected with the thing, that one gets a signal, gets a little pat on the head that says, you are useful. I like you. Mm -hmm. um, and it divides and divides and divides and divides and divides and expands. It has been selected and it expands and makes a whole army, which is actually enough to protect you. Um, and so in fact, in most cases, what we're seeing with infectious disease is a race. How quickly can the microbe reproduce versus how fast can this army reproduce <laughs> in order to kill it? Um, but what I want you to realize first, and the thing that's really, we'll get much more to this expansion when you see the infection and how the army expands later. The point that we're really going to be talking about today is this generation of diversity. And what I want you to realize is that you are doing this whole process at all times and have been since birth to make this diverse set of, of B cells to make antibodies also for your T cells. So again, mom's ever yelling at you that you're not doing anything. Be like, mom, I'm doing BJ or combination. Hello. Um, and this is actually basically why we don't use the term acquired immunity anymore. Because you didn't acquire it. You had it all along. It just adapted. <laughs> it just got better. Better. <laughs> um, you had it. And so we're going to be kind of seeing right now the beginning of this process where we are generating diversity in order to make this diverse pool of cells. So this slide is medium helpful now, but when you are studying for an exam later, it will be very helpful. <laughs> um, this is a little bit of an overview of what I'm going to tell you now, which is how are we solving this antibody diversity problem? How are we making 10 to the 16th different antibody proteins when we have um, about 2.3 times 10 to the fourth genes? And the answer is here. Um, there are two different pieces to the answer. One is something called combinatorial diversity. The other is something called junctional diversity. Um, and they both have two different pieces to them, which you can see here. We are going to go through the details of these two different pieces uh, now, and they will make a whole lot more sense. But just for your broad overview of the answer, that's what the answer is. And now I'm going to explain combinatorial diversity. And today is a great day for me to explain combinatorial diversity. Because what we're going to imagine, we don't have to imagine because it's kind of true, kind of having a rough day. Let's imagine I decided because of my rough day, I'm going to give up on this whole teaching thing. And instead, I'm going to open a restaurant. So let's imagine I'm opening my restaurant, OK? Now, there's also one other thing that is not an exaggeration about opening my restaurant, which is that I'm not very good at cooking. So opening a restaurant is an interesting choice for me. So I know how to cook 
how to cook that. That's all I know how to cook. Okay? That's all I got. And so if you looked at it, you'd be like, well, this is going to be kind of a lame restaurant. But if we, and we can start to think about how many dishes I would have in my restaurant. And you could say, well, pretend I'm all of my things have to have chicken in them <laughs> or have to have meat in them. That's what I got. I got four things I can cook. That gives me three dishes on my menu. Not that great. Now let's imagine I learn how to cook a new thing. Let's imagine I now learn how to cook beef. I only learned one new dish. Yet now, My restaurant has doubled its number of dishes because I'm counting those dishes as combinations of things I know how to cook and not as individuals. I learn one more thing. my menu starts to get a lot bigger. And so what you can see here is I'm only getting a small addition in number of dishes that I can cook. But if I count the actual things on my menu as combos of them, then with any small increase in the number of, of dishes, I get way more combinations. Does this make sense? That's combinatorial diversity. <laughs> That's all it is. And you've already seen one of the two examples of combinatorial diversity this semester already, which is that when we make an antibody, we are pairing together heavy chains and light chains. And the antibody will bind antigen at the place where the heavy chain and the light chain come together. And so if you have a smallish number of heavy chains and light chains. So I have three heavy chains. I have two light chains, or three light chains. So I'm using six genes here. With six genes, I can get nine antibodies. And so it's like I'm saving on genes. I get six genes, nine antibodies, woohoo! And so I can go with a small number of genes, get a big number of antibodies. And you could imagine if I do numbers that are bigger than three, this gets even more and more dramatic. So this is one big piece of combinatorial diversity. And this is in fact really how, how this works. And so one way that we get to that 10 to the 16th antibodies is simply that we're pairing heavy chains and light chains. Scientists then made some additional observations about antibodies. And what they saw was that we can have the same constant region paired with different variable regions. And they saw that we can have the same variable region paired with different constant regions in terms of making our antibody. So not only are we pairing a heavy chain and a light chain, it seems like these two pieces, the sort of darker color and the lighter color, also seem to kind of pair together differently. And based on this observation, scientists made the um, 
hypothesis that was known as the mini gene hypothesis. And the mini gene hypothesis um, indicates that there were several small sub pieces, several small mini genes or parts of genes that get put together in order to make up the gene encoding the antibody. And so we could have multiple pieces. Here you can see V's and K's listed. And you could pair different V's and K's together to give you a final um, gene for uh, an antibody. And so you could imagine this happening for both the heavy chain and the light chain. And so you get tons of combos really quickly. And this is just another way of showing this. So you can see that we can have, um, if we're imagining, say, this is just the heavy chain, um, we've got a couple choices for V, a couple choices for J. We can cut the DNA, put together um, one of those Vs and Js. Each B cell does this differently at random. And each B cell makes a different receptor. And you can see that exact process here where we're going to cut the DNA um, between two different uh, a V and a J, put them back together, paste the DNA, get this new combo. Each B cell does it differently um, to get a different potential combination for the heavy and light chain. So you can sort of do combinatorial diversity inside the heavy chain and light chain and then combine those heavy chains and light chains. Um, so anything strike you as a little wacky here? Let's make sure that we're all clear on what exactly is being shown on this slide. Because there's a thing that's kind of wacky. If Dr. Dunaway was here, yeah. I'm telling you, in order to make antibodies, all of your B cells have to cut their DNA. They have to break their DNA on purpose. They are purposely breaking their DNA and then pasting it back together. Um, that, is, that seems a little nuts, right? That does not seem like it goes with a lot of things you have learned from Bio 250, DNA breaks are real bad. And now I'm telling you every B cell in your body, every cell that makes antibodies broke its DNA during development. Yep, I am, that is correct. One piece to that that you might guess is that this has to be super highly regulated. There have to be a lot of regulations because if not, as Dr. Dunaway would say, you get dead. <laughs> um, and so, especially on Wednesday, we're going to be talking through a lot of the enzymes and like the really nitty gritty details of this. And you're going to be like, oh, this, there's so much, this is painful. It's not that painful. But the point of a lot of those steps is regulating the heck out of this. <laughs> because you can imagine just how bad it would be if this went wrong. So this hypothesis was sort of out there in the fields for a while. Um, but nobody was able to prove it for a long time. Um, and then someone came along and did some experiments um, that allowed him to prove this. Um, this person's name is Tonegawa. Um, Tonegawa did these experiments in 1976. Um, to prove this, um, just so you know, Tonegawa is still alive and actively doing research. He is at MIT. However, after he, he did these experiments, he decided that immunology was over because all of the important problems were solved um, and became a neuroscientist. Um, so, uh, and he did win the Nobel Prize for this experiment. Um, so in this experiment, we can think a little bit about first the general hypothesis he's thinking about with this. So basically, the idea in this experiment is Tonegawa says, OK, if I look at cells that are not immune cells, 
And he, there are different versions of this experiment that use slightly different cell types. Um, so, but the basic idea here is a not immune cell. I think on the next slide it shows liver. It shows liver. Um, in some versions he does liver. They did liver. In another version of the experiment they did um, sperm, because they're like we know that one should not be messed up. <laughs> we know that should be the original. Um, but they, a not immune cell thing. <laughs> I mean, like, the DNA should be in one kind of form there. And if we look at a cell that makes an antibody, the DNA should be different. <laughs> That's basically what, his, what he was trying to show. Is this is DNA different structurally in this case versus this case? So he took a few things. Um, he was able to get some um, cells that could produce antibody, and he could get the mRNA. So he got the mRNA encoding the antibodies. And that mRNA, he labeled. Doesn't really matter how he labeled it. You can imagine it glowing in the dark. We don't really care. <laughs> so he took that DNA and he labeled it. Oh, sorry, this mRNA. He then took DNA from two different kinds of cells. One of them was the not immune cell. Here you can see it's liver, um, but it could be whatever not immune cell. And he also took some DNA from cells that make the antibody. And he ran that DNA out on a gel. And this is all the DNA, so you can see he got DNA of all sizes. He got all the DNA <laughs> here. So there's the, all the DNA. And then, He tried to take this um, mRNA and hybridize it to the DNA. He tried to find the DNA that matched it, that was complementary to it. When he looked at the antibody producing cells, he got a band. There was a piece of DNA that matched the, M the mRNA good thing, because that's where RNA comes from. But when he looked at the non-immune cell, he found two bands. This piece of mRNA matched two different pieces of DNA. It matched, you can imagine a piece of DNA over here, and a piece of DNA over here. It matched two different places of the DNA. Instead of matching one place. He also could use other labeled versions, which is also what's shown here. But the idea that he was able to show here is the DNA actually moved. The DNA changed its structure. What used to be two separate pieces now was one. And so this really helped in um, supporting the mini gene hypothesis. If you imagine you are trying to do experiments to support this hypothesis, the mini gene hypothesis, I like this guy on the right is a good way of thinking about this. One thing that you could look for is you could look to see did the DNA change from this guy to this guy, right? And that's what Tonegawa did in the experiment I just showed you. There's one other prediction you might be able to make from looking at this hypothesis. What else could you look for to tell you if this hypothesis was true or not? Yeah, Sydney. Um, so, you, so then you'd be looking for this, which you already showed that, it's, that in the stem cell it's different than in the post cell. You just showed that the DNA changed. Real easy, guys. Don't overthink it. Look at the picture. 
Yeah, Jamie. We'd also predict that you'd find some circles <laughs> of the cutout trash DNA, right? If this little cartoon is true, you would predict you would also find these circles of DNA that are going to get trashed. And so Tonegawa looked in those cells that are producing antibody, and he found lots of that circular trash DNA. Um, again, kind of um, suggesting that the mini-gene hypothesis was in fact correct. Um, and so basically, we now know that the way that this process works is that our B cell is going to recombine uh, unique V, D, and J segments in order to make um, the DNA that is going to encode the antibody. Uh, and you, we can see this in more detail here. So this process of cutting the DNA and pasting it back together happens twice in our B cell, once to make a heavy chain and once to make a light chain. The heavy chain details are shown at the top. So for the heavy chain, we have three different segments that we put together. We choose one segment called a V segment, one segment called a D segment, and one segment called a J segment, and put them together. So we pick any V, we pick any D, we pick any J, we put them together. Um, that goes in front of our constant region, and that gives us our heavy chain. This is also why we often call this process VDJ recombination. Recombination just meaning cutting and pasting DNA. Um, what you will notice is that the V segment in the heavy chain is encoding amino acids 1 to 101. Um, the D is around 102 to 106. The J is around um, 107 to 123. Um, and so this is, these are all coming together to make that unique variable region. Um, for the light chain, we are only putting together two segments, a V and a J. Um, you can see in the light chain case, the V encodes uh, amino acids 1 to 97, the J encodes around 98 to 110, and there is another constant region further downstream. Um, so you can also see this in another figure from your textbook here. Um, the top, the two of these that are on top, because why would this be easy? Um, are both versions of a light chain. So in fact, you have two different light chain choices. We'll care about those light chain choices next time. For now, they're the light chain. <laughs> um, they have Vs and they have Ks. Uh, or, or sorry, they have Vs and they have Js. Um, one of them sits on chromosome 2. The other sits on chromosome 22. Um, and then we have chromosome 14 which is where the heavy chain sits. And this includes our Vs, our Ds, our Js, and all of our constant regions. If you remember, when I taught you about the different isotypes and the different constant regions, I told you about MDs give everyone apples. If you look at the order of the constant region choices on the genome, it's M, D, G, E, A. MDs give everyone apples. So in fact, that mnemonic also reminds me what order those constant region sections sit in on the genome. Um, so there's also one other piece that you should notice uh, that's important to notice about this slide. Um, so if you take a look, the heavy chain is the nicest example of this, although you can see it on all of these. You can also see that in some places in this figure, they list the amounts of DNA, how far apart these mini genes are, these partial genes are. So you can see those distances marked. So what do you see about this distance here between the V and the J um, in this portion of the light chain? Yeah, Sebastian. It's a pretty big distance. That's a huge amount of DNA. Huge. It's a huge stretch. Um, we've got another big stretch here. We've got another big stretch here. We've got all these, there's like a giant stretch right there. 
there's some really big stretches here. Um, this is actually also really important because when we do this recombination, we cut out some of those big stretches of DNA. If we were going to do a recombination here, we cut out at least 23 kilobases of DNA. That's going to put this region, this part of the DNA, closer to this other part. Why is that important? Well, just upstream of all of those V regions, there are promoters. Downstream at the end of this, there are enhancers. Normally, those promoters and those enhancers are so far away from each other, they can never actually turn on. They can never actually do anything. And so, in a normal cell, there's no transcription at this area. Because that promoter and that enhancer can never work together. They're just too far apart. But if we cut out all the DNA in the middle, suddenly the promoter and the enhancer are quite close. And now we can actually have um, some activity and we can get transcription at that locus. Um, and so actually making this transcribable is really important. Um, and kind of thinking about how long our transcript could potentially be um, is going to be really important. And so this is sort of an overview of how this works. Um, and this is specifically looking at the heavy chain. Um, the, uh, we will see uh, the light chain in a second. So what you can see is we've got our V, D, and our J, as well as all of our constant region pieces. Um, in the DNA, in that developing cell, we're going to break the DNA and do rearrangements so that we get the V, D, and J close to each other. The stuff outside of this region, see all this downstream business? It stays. <laughs> we don't do anything to it. If there was upstream business, that would stay too. And so we're just going to have all of this DNA it can now be transcribed to make a big, long RNA with all this business still in it. Then we splice that RNA to have just what we need. And then we make the protein. And you can see that VDJ region, which was the red, green, yellow, is now the variable region of that antibody, whereas all these constant region exons form the constant region sections. And we can see the same thing with the light chain. So this light chain process is happening separately in the same cell. We're going to take our V and our J. We're going to put them together in the DNA. We only have to do it once here. I'm having to do it twice in the chain. Um, then we're going to have you know, this downstream business is all going to stay. Upstream business would also stay. Um, we get our transcript of our RNA. We splice it to have just what we wanted. And then the V and J come together to form the variable region of the light chain, we have just the constant region exon um, after that. Um, and so hopefully I have convinced you at this point of the fact that um, understanding the idea of um, combinatorial diversity helps us solve this problem and go from a really small number of pieces of DNA to a really big number of um, antibodies. And just to give you a for the sort of this in math forms, so for the heavy chain, um, there are 45 V choices, 23 Ds, and 6 Js. And so if you just multiply out how many combos you get, you get 6,210. And that's less than 100 genes. Um, for the light chain, there are, because there's two light chains, because everything's awesome, um, we come out to uh, basically 370 light chains with about, again, less than 100 genes. And then if we pair up the heavy chains and the light chains, we get 2 million um, potential antibody genes out of less than 200 um, pieces of DNA. Um, and so this combinatorial diversity is getting us a lot in terms of antibody diversity. Yep, Justin. Uh, 
Uh, great question. So your body has already made the RNA. So you, you have one cell hanging out, ready to go. And so the problem is getting that one cell and the pathogen in the same place. How is it that, what if like it's in your little toe and the pathogen is like in your nose? <laughs> That's the problem. Is, and so this is why we have the secondary lymphoid organs to sort of collect things together. So basically everything gets pulled to the secondary lymphoid organ. The, the nasal um, microbe would get pulled to your local lymph nodes and your lymphocytes are just gonna check secondary lymphoid organs. And as soon as they find the one they need, they're gonna start dividing, dividing, dividing. So they've already done this part of it. In fact, when you see a new microbe, no more DNA breaking is happening. The DNA breaking happened when you made those cells like years before. You're just gonna have that cell divide and divide and divide and expand and make an army of itself because it's been told, yes, you're good, we need more of you. Does that make sense? Okay. You, you will see there are many places throughout this process where immune cells are needy. Sometimes I'm like, you guys are a little, little too needy. They need pats on the head a lot. You'll notice my pats on the head um, for immune cells pretty often. So this is one of the pats on the head. Um, so when we talked about the structure of our antibody, we also um, talked a little bit about the complementarity determining regions, um, which were those little loops that came off the end of our immunoglobulin domain. You can see my three little loops here that come off the immunoglobulin domain and are touching the antigen. So remember, those were these nice little loops. They were, in fact, hypervariable. They are the parts of the antibody that vary the most. And they, like I said, they are making the contact. And so we might wonder how that maps onto what we are seeing in terms of our, um, in terms of uh, this VDJ recombination process. If we actually look at the um, sort of gene, um, the complementarity determining regions are indicated here in these dotted boxes. You can see that Two of them are just based on which V region you picked. But one of them is actually made by the joining. And so it's made by the unique sequence that comes from joining all these pieces. And so it's going to be super variable and super unique. Um, that's the, the third CDR uh, in both cases. And so you can see that, in fact, the reason why the, these areas are the most diverse from antibody to antibody, especially in the case of CDR3, is that they are the ones that are actually being made by this junction, by this unique joining. Um, so if you look at this slide, you might imagine a question coming up. Um, and so can you imagine any potential question that comes up here? Yeah, Jamie. Where do the rest of them come from? I just gave you math to get up to 10 to the 6, which is like amazing from 200 genes. But I told you that the answer is, two, is 10 to the 16, not 10 to the 6. Um, so we got to have something else going on in order to make this work a little bit better. Everything I've told you about thus far is that process I mentioned called combinatorial diversity. The rest of the, the variation comes from this other process of junctional diversity. Junctional diversity sounds like it must be real fancy. And I don't think it's very fancy. Junctional diversity just means that when we paste together two pieces of DNA, we don't do a very good job with it. Sometimes we add and subtract base pairs. So when we make that junction, we can add or subtract base pairs to give us a little extra spice in our repertoire. Um, and so you can imagine that even if I had four B cells that all tried to put this pink segment with this uh, yellow segment, 
they can all do it in slightly different ways, adding and subtracting base pairs. And so I could, even if I had four B cells who all picked the same DNAs, they could get different antibodies out of it because of the number of base pairs that they added or subtracted. Um, and so this final piece um, of junctional diversity is really what gets us up to our big numbers. This textbook gives you a 10 to the 13th. I gave you 10 to the 16th. It doesn't really matter. The answer is a lot. <laughs> um, and so this is, kind of, like I said, this is sort of our general overview of the process that is happening. Um, so just as a reminder, we are still out at this part of the response. We are in the primary lymphoid organs. We are developing these cells. These cells have not even left the bone marrow yet to go find viruses or bacteria. This is still development. We're still kind of keeping them close to home. This is all happening in the absence of antigen. And this is, like I said, this is the most common misconception about immunology, is that you suddenly make a new cell in response to your infection. Nope, you had it all along. You just expanded that cell by making far more copies of it. Um, and so, I can't say it enough. <laughs> BDJ recombination happens in the absence of antigen. <laughs> um, and here you can see it in a different way. That B cell was already present before exposure and then went through all of these changes and expansions as time went on. Because again, think about it. If the idea is that you're going to make a receptor in response to something after you see it, how did you see it without the receptor? You have to have a receptor before you can see something. <laughs> and so in fact, you're making all these receptors. Right now, you all have a B cell that makes an antibody that binds to Ebola perfectly. Let us all hope that that B cell never gets used. One of my uh, immunology colleagues talks about those cells sometimes of dying of unrequited love. Let us hope that that poor sad cell just never sees. <laughs> um, huh? <laughs> um, this process of VDJ recombination is in fact one of the things that we use to define adaptive immunity. Um, so VDJ recombination is a hallmark of adaptive immunity. Um, if you remember, when I told you about innate versus adaptive immunity, um, I said there was some weird stuff about receptors and things. <laughs> um, in the uh, innate immune system, we have these conserved germline encoded receptors. That just means they're normal old receptors. They're receptors that are encoded like every other thing you learned about in Bio 250. <laughs> Whereas the adaptive immune response is actually partially defined by the fact that we have VDJ recombination um, happening. Um, in the, these organisms. And so this is sort of one of the things, like I said, that we use in order to define um, adaptive immunity. Um, and in fact, um, this is the thing that makes the immune response of jawed vertebrates different than other organisms. Um, so it's actually super cool. Um, if you look at immune responses, all of a sudden, um, about 550 million years ago, um, it seems as though there was a big change in um, the genome of our ancestors. Something happened, and they suddenly got this entire process that allowed them to do adaptive immunity. Um, basically, it, we went from like no adaptive immune response to the entire adaptive immune response, this whole recombination process, sometimes referred to as the immunological big bang. Um, we can talk more about how that happened because it's so cool. But um, <laughs> so um, there are people who can not do VDJ recombination. Um, they have different types of mutations. Um, basically, they have problems with some of the proteins that are involved in this process. 
Um, if you do not have the proteins that are involved in this process, then you do not have T cells or B cells. Um, that is a situation where you have no adaptive immune response. Um, you might have heard of the boy in the bubble syndrome. Um, this is the boy in the bubble. Um, usually referred to as SCID or uh, severe combined immunodeficiency. Um, extreme susceptibility to infections. Um, it's, a, it's a huge problem. Um, many of the genes that are frequently involved in this are on um, the X chromosome, which is why it is very frequently a boy in a bubble, um, as it's an ex excellent trait. Um, so this is pretty important, um, kind of bad if you can't do uh, this process. Um, one other downside of this process is that it does allow our antibodies to be really specific. They're so specific that sometimes by making small changes, microbes can evade them. And so here you can see a sort of stylized example of a purple virus. By the time we expand the B cells that make purple antibody, the virus might have changed. So now purple antibodies don't do anything because we got a red virus. And by the time we get some red antibodies, the virus might have changed again. So this is the downside of the adaptive immune system compared to the innate, where we don't have this ease of mutation, where we are recognizing conserved structures that aren't alterable by mutation. Um, with the adaptive immune response, this is our downside. Um, but we've already kind of implied the next thing. So if Dr. Dunaway was here, I mean, I can do this too. It's not like I need him, but Dr. Dunaway was here. Um, we could, you could think about different types of cancers. And so you might want to think about what, what parts of your body most frequently have tumors. Where are the most common cancers? Like if you think about it, what's the most common body type that has cancer? Yeah, go for it. Dr. Dunaway, we just talked about you. <laughs> Dr. Dunaway, what is the what type of body? What, what part of your body is most frequently? Uh, or do we most frequently see tumors in? Where's the most com what, most common type of cancer? Gener generally specific tissue type. Here. No. Yes. False. Here. Here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So other than the fact that he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Skin. 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 Yeah. Yeah. The fact that I'm pointing here, uh -huh. you're automatically assuming I'm not pointing to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, touche, you, partner. Okay. <laughs> In any case, skin. <laughs> the answer to my question. Um, why skin? Yeah. It's um, most rapidly replaced by the cell. Okay. What were you going to say, Justin? Okay. It's also in contact with the environment and can get mutated or can get hit by something like, you know, me, the sun, because I get some burn if I think about the sun very hard. But you can imagine that your skin is in contact with the outside world. If you make a list of most of the tissues that are frequently uh, undergoing cancer, you generally are going to get a whole bunch of tissues that are frequently in contact with the outside world, except for one. The one that ranks way too high is, the, is immune cells, leukemias and lymphomas. It's all like stuff in the outside world, stuff in contact with the outside world, and also. <laughs> 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 
DNA so much. That makes leukemias and lymphomas more frequent than they should be based on the exposure of immune cells to the outside world. That's why we have to regulate this process very uh, tightly. And we will start talking about that on Wednesday when he will have been told that I was right.